My name is Madeline Claire Ellish, a research lead for the AI on the Ground initiative here at Data and Society. Um, it is my sincere pleasure and honor to welcome you to Data and Society for this talk um, by Shoshana Zuboff on, based on her recently released book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier. I would now like to turn it over to Shoshana, uh, whose career has been devoted to the study of the rise of the digital, its individual, organizational, and social consequences, and its relationships to the history and future of capitalism since she began in 1978, before many realized. <laughs> <laughs> But she was writing about this before many realized how important these issues um, would become. Her work is just seminal in this field. Um, she was one of the first tenured women at Harvard Business School, joining in 1981. She was the Charles Edward Wilson Professor of Business Administration. Um, uh, in 2004 and 2015, she was a faculty associate at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. She also founded and led the executive education program, Odyssey School for the Second Half of Life. Please help me welcome Shoshana Zuboff. This book was published um, here January 15th and then a couple weeks later in, in England, and I've been I've been in uh, five cities, uh, three countries in the last five weeks talking to, to groups of people. And I began with a simple experiment and now it's grown into a source of real fascination and I think importance. And so I want you to be part of it. So it goes like this. Something brought you here today Maybe it's just because you like to come to Data and Society and they have great cheese receptions. <laughs> but something else, perhaps. A question, a preoccupation, a concern. And I would like to invite you to just focus very gently for a moment on what it is that brought you here today. What is it, that thing inside you that brought you here today and then just boil it down to one word, and then just shout out the word. And Kasha's gonna write down the words as you shout them out, and I'll probably repeat them so everybody can, can hear them. Advertising. Advertising. Anti-capitalism, Anti -capitalism? did I get that right? Anti-capitalism. What was it? Panopticon. Panopticon. Profiling. Fear. Fear. Humanity. Humanity. Equality. Inequality. Resistance. Resistance. Exploitation. Exploitation. Bias. Bias. Solution. Revolution? Solution. Oh, solution. Sorry. Well, they're close. <laughs> Revolution two. Okay, we need both, Kasha. <laughs> we need revolution and solution. <laughs> what else? Determinism. Determinism. Sovereignty. Sovereignty. Manipulation. Manipulation. Democracy. Democracy. Thank you, Doc. Dignity. Dignity. Autonomy. I was just making a couple of notes from uh, a meeting the other night. Just writing, because I wasn't smart enough to ask someone like Kasha to write down, so I was trying to write as people were talking. Agency, rebellion, revolution, fear, anxiety, manipulation, control, identity, freedom, resistance, power, democracy, law. This was from an evening in London a few nights ago. And I have almost an identical list from several evenings in Brussels, other evenings in London and in Cambridge, and then also New York, Washington, Boston, 
the same words, the same words every time, the same words. So I've been thinking about this a lot and trying to understand what does this mean, the same words. Um, and I think it means something deeper than what meets the eye. Because we're all gathered here together, you know, and obviously it's, it's not a random group. It's people who are interested in this, in this topic. I get that. But, um, but there's no sort of category that binds us. There's no category that unites us. When we think about capitalism in the 19th and 20th centuries, you know, the titanic struggles of, that, of those eras, of that industrial era, uh, was the struggle between capital and labor. And the power of capital bore down on us as workers, as employees, in our economic roles, in the economic domain, in factories, in offices. Something different is happening now. The titanic struggles of capital today have washed over the walls of the factories and the offices, at least those that are left. They've surpassed the economic domain. They have flooded the whole space that we think of as the social society. They bear down on each one of us not because of a specific economic role that we play, but simply because we are here living our lives. This is our time. And these forces bear down on our bodies, on our homes, in our cars, in our cities. They know our tears. They know our bloodstream. They know our pancreas. They know our conversations. They know our emotions, they know our personality, they know our futures. And yet, what are we called? We don't have a name. We are not workers. We are not laborers. We don't have a name. The only name we have is the name that they gave us users this is not okay what i'm learning and maybe maybe you learn this with me maybe you disagree but what i'm learning is that what these words in different countries and different cities and across different generations are expressing are the social political psychological and economic interests that are emerging for us in our new experience in a new era of capital that is no longer confined to the economic domain. Let me give you an analogy. In the 1830s, the first third of the 19th century in Britain, where industrial capitalism was slowly taking form, slowly emerging as a new kind of capitalism. There were two words for the social classes. If you looked at the whole social hierarchy, there were only two labels. One was aristocracy, and the other was the lower classes. And everyone who wasn't aristocratic was grouped into this big melange, the lower classes. So that included everyone from bankers and merchants to paupers. Everyone was just part of the lower classes. And there's a very specific and interesting history how the conditions of industrial capitalism took hold and the factories emerged and the the new forms of work uh, and the new forms of economic oppression. And under the pressure of those new forms, a new consciousness was born. And the idea of the laborer emerged. It wasn't already given, it emerged out of a felt 
recognition of shared interests that were new in the world. And that felt recognition, that new consciousness, became the basis for the new forms of collective action that eventually mobilized the, the emergence of democracies in, in our societies and eventually formed the basis of power that, that tethered industrial capitalism to the interests of society and to the requirements of democracy and to democratic values and principles such that over the decades and indeed well into the 20th century, we could talk about something like a market democracy and we could experience some kind of equilibrium in which capitalism and its raw excesses were tethered to the needs of people and society and democracy. I wonder if this is our time now to emerge from this amorphous non-entity of users, which is a word that says we don't matter and we have no interests, as we through these words, anxiety, manipulation, control, freedom, democracy, resistance, rebellion, solution, as we begin to identify our true interests and through that discover the new forms of collective action, it won't be the solutions of the 20th or the 19th century but there will be new forms of collective action and collaborative action that bind us and that allow us to compel and harness the resources of our democratic institutions to restrain, interrupt, and even outlaw the raw excesses of a rogue mutation of capitalism that I call surveillance capitalism, which is now illegitimately claiming a dominant role in our democracy, our society, and indeed in our lives. I'm just going to do a couple of little definitions about uh, surveillance capitalism. Is there anybody in the room who's actually read the book yet? All right, I'm glad I brought the gold stars. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, you know, people say, eh, 700 page book. It's really not 700 pages. That's just what it says on the Amazon page, you know, because they count every single page. It's actually 524 pages plus one paragraph. <laughs> so that's like, that's a long weekend, folks. You know, in fact, there's a long weekend coming up, I think. So it's not, it's not, it's not so long. I define surveillance capitalism this way. Surveillance capitalism departs in many respects from the history of market capitalism. But in this respect, it mirrors that history. Um, people have long discussed the way in which capitalism evolves by claiming things that have their own life outside of the market dynamic and bringing them into the market dynamic so that they can be turned into commodities for sale and purchase. So famously, for example, industrial capitalism claimed nature. Nature lives its own life, the forests and the meadows and the, and the waters and the rivers and the oceans and, the, and so forth, the mountains, its own life now claimed by industrial capitalism for the market dynamic to be reborn as real estate, as land to be sold and purchased. Famously, industrial capitalism claimed work, the kinds of things that people did in their fields, in their cottages, in their homes, in their gardens, claimed that for the market dynamic to be to be reborn as labor, labor that could have a price attached to it, wage labor, to be sold and purchased. Surveillance capitalism follows in this tradition by claiming private human experience as a source of free, raw material for subordination to the market dynamic, where it is reborn as behavioral data. These behavioral data 
are then combined with world historic computational capabilities that we generally refer to as things like machine intelligence, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Really, the labels are secondary to the thing. That these are computational capabilities that have never before existed. And the combination of behavioral data and world historic computational capabilities are aimed at one goal. And that is to produce predictions of human behavior what we will do now, soon, and later. And these predictions, think of them as prediction products. These predictions are then sold in a new kind of marketplace in which business customers, not us, business customers have an interest in betting on our future. And it is business customers who are now vying to lay their bets on these predictions, to purchase these prediction products, to know our futures. So these are markets in behavioral futures. Just like we have markets in pork belly futures and oil futures, these are markets in behavioral futures, which is why I call them behavioral futures markets. Now, this may seem sort of weird and science fiction-y and whatever, but really, it's just a tiny um, stroke of the dial of abstraction on what has become commonplace in our lives. And that starts with online targeted advertising. These online targeted advertising markets, uh, well, let me roll back uh, one sentence by saying, this logic was pretty much invented at Google. Like with mass production pieces, there were elements of it that were out and about, but it really all came together at Google in 2001 under the heat of financial emergency and the dot-com uh, bubble bursting. Um, in the same way that, that mass production elements of that had been around in you know, the armories and the Singer sewing machine and various things, but really all came together at the Ford Motor Company at a certain place in time uh, under the heat of uh, Ford's own financial emergency, uh, having gone bankrupt twice and now uh, really trying to make it work the third time. So when we think about uh, what was invented there. I'm not going to go into all the details because we'll, it'll just run through too much time. But essentially, what is, what is it that happened? They figured out that they could take data that they were not using to actually improve their products and services, stuff that was sitting around in data logs that at that time was called waste, it was called data exhaust, it was called digital breadcrumbs, it was collateral leftover stuff from search and so forth behavior discovered that it had great predictive power, discovered that they could put that together with their even then considerable computational uh, capabilities, and that with that, they could produce a prediction of a piece of future behavior. In this case, that future behavior was pretty specific. It was a click through, but that's a future behavior. And what those online uh, targeted ad folks were doing, they were buying these predictions of future behavior. And the way it happened was um, Google said, look, you know, you used to pick the keywords, you used to decide where your ads are gonna go. You're not gonna do that anymore. We're gonna use this special computational capability and our proprietary data. We're gonna tell you the result. We're gonna tell you where to put your ad. And if you just follow along, you will make money. And at first, like, they didn't want to do that because they didn't like the black box idea and we want to know what's going on and we want to pick. But eventually they, they agreed and they went with the black box and they picked the computational result, the prediction product that came out of these analyses and lo and behold, they made money and Google made money. And um, very interesting to note between that moment of financial emergency See, in the year 2000, Google's revenues were about uh, 86 million. Um, when it IPO'd in 2004, and, and the fruit of these activities first became known to the world 
uh, we saw that their revenue line increased by 3,590%. So you're standing over here. So that's a curve that goes like this. <laughs> That's on the strength of a new economic logic that depended upon the social relations of the one-way mirror. Because they quickly understood that in order to find these very predictive data, they not only could scrape them from their data logs, but they could go hunt them in all kinds of online environments. And they were very explicit about seeing that they could hunt and take outside of people's awareness because they knew even then that asking would not be a profitable undertaking. So from the start, all of this, all of these constant, the, the taking of private experience for translation into data had to be secret. It was designed to keep us users in ignorance. And over the years, that has proved to be extremely successful, that our ignorance has been their bliss, ergo surveillance capitalism. All right, so that's a little bit of an introduction. There's so much more to say. But um, I thought maybe I would just read you a couple of short graphs uh, just to give you some personal uh, kind of personal take I have on this and, and set the stage and then we'll go with our questions and hopefully with that we'll be able to elaborate more and more pieces of this including getting into the interface with democracy and what does all this mean for our democracy. How many people in this room have children? Okay. How many people in this room are under the age of 35? Okay, so what this means is that everybody in this room either has children or is children. <laughs> <laughs> and this is really important because in, I spent seven years literally locked away writing this book and um, the thing that really guided me on this was, was my, my feeling for my children's future. My son is in the back. I'm so proud my son is here with me today, Jake Maxman, my pride and joy. Um, <laughs> um, my kids don't always get to come to these events, but it makes me so happy when they can. Um, seeing into my children's future and being afraid of what I saw, that was a real big motivator for me. But of course, I'm, I'm not naturally a selfish person, so it's a very quick step from there to be worried about everybody's children, and all the young people that I know, and all the young people that I meet. Um, so these are two paragraphs that I wrote for my children and all the young people that I meet when I'm teaching, when I'm on the road. And these are things that I want either you to know to tell your children, or if you are one of the children in the room, I want you to know this in your heart. And that's why I'm reading this right now. So this is way at the end of the book, uh, page 521 to be specific. <laughs> when I speak to my children or an audience of young people, I try to alert them to the historically contingent nature of the thing that has us by calling attention to ordinary values and expectations before surveillance capitalism began its campaign of psychic numbing. It is not okay to have to hide in your own life. It is not normal, I tell them. It is not okay to spend your lunchtime conversations comparing software that will camouflage you and protect you from unwanted continuous invasion. Five trackers blocked, four trackers blocked, 59 trackers blocked, facial features scrambled, voice disguised. I tell them that the word search has meant a daring existential journey, not a fingertip to already existing answers. That friend is an embodied mystery that can be forged only face to face and heart to heart, and that recognition 
is the glimmer of homecoming we experience in our beloved's face, not facial recognition. I say that it is not okay to have our best instincts for connection, empathy, and information exploited by a draconian quid pro quo that holds these good hostage to the pervasive strip search of our lives. It is not okay for every move, emotion, utterance, and desire to be cataloged, manipulated, and then used to surreptitiously herd us through the future tense for the sake of someone else's profit. These things are brand new, I tell them. They are unprecedented. You should not take them for granted because they are not okay. If democracy is to be replenished in the coming decades, it is, for, it is up to us to rekindle the sense of outrage and loss over what is being taken from us. In this, I do not mean only our personal information. What is at stake here is the human expectation of sovereignty over one's own life and authorship of one's own experience. What is at stake is the inward experience from which we form the will to will and the public spaces to act on that will. What is at stake is the dominant principle of social ordering in an information civilization and our rights as individuals and societies to answer the questions, who knows, who decides, who decides, who decides. And so if we are, if we are coming up with the same words in different countries and different cities, across generations and across societies. Isn't this really about the beginning of an information civilization that we are all participants in? And isn't this really the beginning of the contest of what kind of civilization it will be? What will be its moral milieu? What will be its values? What will be its balance of knowledge and power? Who knows? Who decides? Who decides who decides? Thank you. Um, so I do, I have, I, have, um, I have a whole page of questions that I'm just dying to ask. Um, but I think for the sake of time, I'm going to ask one. And then I know that you're very interested. And I know we have an amazing group of people in the room. So um, I think I'll intersperse and, and take take a, the host prerogative. Um, but so one of the things that I, I mean, surveillance capitalism is such an evocative term. And I think it really captures what people are wanting to put a name to. Um, and I think one of the most exciting provocations in the book is to explicitly place surveillance capitalism in the register of exploitation. Um, and specifically, right, like capturing and um, make, exploiting raw resources. Um, and then the lopsided accumulation of wealth that proceeds. Um, and so James Bridal, as we were talking, um, in his review of your book, actually referred to this dynamic um, and uh, this move, quote unquote, of such audacity that it bears comparison to the enclosure of the commons or colonial conquests. The tech giants unilaterally declared that these previously untapped resources were theirs for the taking. And I'm really struck by that framing because I, I, I think that there's this really accurate and compelling parallel between surveillance capitalism and previous colonial encounters that in fact underpinned a lot of the sort of previous um, industrial possibilities that unfolded in Europe. Um, and so, right, because in, in many ways, we're also seeing this sort of parallel between the US and China, two countries accumulating, um, making use of resources, while many places, in, generally in the global south, are experiencing kind of digital data colonialism. Um, and I think that uh, I, I, this is sort of brought out in your book. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how surveillance capitalism might be a way to help us think about 
a global economy and the global distribution of resources um, that, that is at stake. Can you ask a more challenging question? <laughs> okay, let's get right down to everything. <laughs> All right, so yes, I mean in the, you know, in the book I, I um, in fact, I explicitly explore the analogy of the Spanish conquest, um, which has, has so many analogous elements to this. Uh, but in general, you know, the Spanish conquest is often regarded by historians as a kind of template of the, the, the conquest pattern, uh, the, the sort of, um, you know, archetype of the conquest pattern where there's a, a unilateral taking um, right down to the notice and consent requirements. Uh, the Spanish court had its lawyers developed an edict called the requerimiento, uh, and so the, the, these guys, you know, in their uh, brocade and armor and their heavy beards and weaponry would go sneaking through the jungles, the Caribbean jungles in the night and come upon a village. And the whole idea was to make this a legal taking. They had to read the edict of the requerimiento and then they had to get people's agreement. Mm -hmm. And if people disagreed, then they were free to murder and slaughter and burn. Uh, the thing is, of course, the edict was written in Spanish, read to indigenous peoples <laughs> who had never before seen Spaniards, let alone heard Spanish. And it was so cynically imposed, uh, and this will remind you of something, that they got to a point where it was so cynical that they would like, be at the edge of the, uh, of the forest line before they got to the before they got to the village and, and just at the edge of dawn in the, in the jungle still, and the soldiers would rec recite their requerimiento under their breath, into their beards, you know, and then they didn't hear any response, so then they would just go in and burn the village. So this is like notice and consent, <laughs> in case you're wondering. <laughs> this is the same structure of notice and consent except without the murder part, without the burning and the torture part. Um, but the idea is an illegitimate unilateral taking. And this comes out in the book that, you know, early on the Google founders understood that human experience was the new virgin wood. They understood that, that that would be the thing that could be claimed and monetized. And they understood that it would be very cheap to do so not only in the online environment, but out in the real world where devices, sensors, cameras, blah, 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 all of the digital infrastructure, all the saturation of digital architecture that now surrounds us would be both ubiquitous and extremely cheap. So this, this was, a, this was a, a vision early on. And it is, it is certainly a vision of unilateral dispossession and I write about the many, many dis dispossession strategies that were honed over time, including when they were challenged, uh, which is something that's going on right now with Facebook. And we're seeing the, the, what I call the, the stages of the dispossession cycle unfold. Uh, incursion, habituation, adaptation, redirection. Uh, stages that they go through to to cope with the um, how how to institutionalize the dispossession and how to demobilize uh, the resistance that is offered to it as is being offered now like okay no more pictures of self harm on on Instagram you know adaptation anyway it's all there so so. When it, when it comes to surveillance capitalism, to get into your, glo now your global, the global exploitation, um, I've tried to isolate some of the economic imperatives at work here because in order for prediction, for, so competition in, in surveillance capitalism revolves around predicting the future. So surveillance capitalists are, are competing on who's got the best predictions. The best predictions approximate observation, right? I mean, the best prediction is one that is just like actually seeing the thing. You don't have to predict it, it's, it's happening. So 
these imperatives have have become more dynamic and more pernicious over the, the last two decades. Economies of scale, we need a lot of behavioral data, a lot of these surplus data to make good predictions. Economies of scope, we need different qualities of data. Now it's gotta come from your emotions, from your face, from your voice, from where you run, from where you shop, from what you do in the city, from how you look for a parking space. And then ultimately from what I call economies of action. Economies of action means the very best, the choices, predictive data comes from actually intervening in the state of play and tuning behavior, hurting behavior, shunting, manipulating behavior so that it moves in the direction of the outcomes that are aligned with our commercial objectives. And I write about Pokemon Go, for example, as an experimental dry run at population level herding. The skills of herding populations in ways that are strictly maintained to bypass the awareness of individuals in order to nevertheless herd them along the lines and toward the, toward the spaces and places where guaranteed commercial outcomes will be fulfilled. And that is the, in the case of Pokemon Go, the establishments, the restaurants, the pizza joints, the bars, the service stations, blah, 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 who paid Pokemon Go, the McDonald's franchises, who paid Pokemon Go, Niantic Labs, Google Incubated, as you all know, probably, um, paid Niantic Labs for footfall in exactly the same way that online targeted advertisers pay Google and Facebook and, and, and others for what? For click-through rates. So footfall in the real world is click-through in the online world. And it's the same now taking the same, right. So I'm getting to the big question here. So what is this all saying? In order to move toward the best predictions, the impetus is always toward totality. There are no boundaries. It's not like, oh, we want this group and not that group, or we want this country and not that country, or we want these data and not those data. Ultimately, the digital architecture over which we have all poured so much, um, so much effort, into which we have placed so much hope, into which we have placed our dreams for an empowering and a democratizing information civilization. This digital architecture, which I call not big brother, but big other, because it doesn't really care about us at all. It really doesn't care who you are or what you do. It doesn't care if you are happy or sad. It doesn't care if you are alt-right or alt-left. It really does not give a toss about you. All it cares about is that whoever you are and whatever you do, you do it in a way that it can get the data. This is what I call radical indifference. There is a, a economic compulsion toward totality of data. And this is what pushes it first from, uh, from online to offline, across the offline, deep into our personalities, across our activities, and then across our, our homes, our cars, our cities, our regions, our countries, our societies, and our world. There are no boundaries to totality. The more behavioral data, the more prediction, the better the prediction, the more lucrative, the more powerful these behavioral futures markets. Can I just end with one little picture? I did this uh, really fun little TV show. Uh, do we even get to, it, it's a TV show. Anyway, I, um, you probably know it better than I do, Cheddar TV. Okay, you all know it. So it, you, you film it down on the New York Stock Exchange, which if you've never been there, you should go there because it's like about the size of this room. The New York Stock Exchange is so quaint, you know? It's really a, like a 19th century space with a lot of screens. But it was so easy to sit there and imagine the whole stock exchange being uh, trading future, behavioral futures. 
And you could, I could easily imagine, okay, so here you got your traders that specializes in tranches of individuals. Like individuals who love to run or individuals who buy uh, hemp or whatever. You know, tranches of individuals. And then you've got your, you know, then you've got your, your, your traders who specialize in cities and your traders who specialize in regions and your traders who specialize in populations and global population, right? Because now we're getting into democracy. Because now as we're talking about global populations and where they're going and what they're doing and how we herd and tune them to aim to get to where it's gonna pay off, that's where we're replacing democracy with computation and aiming toward totality. So this is, these are the things that are evoked in me as part of the answer to your question. There are no boundaries. They need everything. I'm generally a very dark and critical person, but I have to ask this question, uh, which is, you know, are there any possibilities for sites of resistance precisely because turning something into a resource means is there can it be claimed by someone else like prediction works only as only in so far as it is correct are there ways to throw uh, throw a wrench into the into the wheels is there a way to um uh, they're like a, a research project um, by a former fellow here, Surya Matu, who, um, uh, Antigua, Antigua Brain, I'm not sure if it was a co, it was co? Someone tell me. Anyways, um, the- We'll it, say it was co. It, we'll say it was co. It was um, a way to trick Fitbits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah. like you put it on a metronome and it like tricks Fitbits <laughs> into thinking that you're moving, but you're actually not, it's just on a Fitbit. So are there sites of resistance, or is it just really we're just Okay, well, this is why I read those paragraphs. Because I, 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 I want us to go bigger. I don't think we can afford to spend the next decade tricking Fitbit, even though there is no more Fitbit, but oh, whatever. Maybe we tricked it <laughs> into <laughs> self-annihilation. Um, look, what I just, the things that I've laid out to you yeah, I get it, they sound dark. I don't feel dark about this at all. I feel super optimistic about this, and I'll tell you why. Um, surveillance capitalism has imposed a couple of major category errors on our thinking as part of the propaganda. One category error is that this is all about digital technology, and this is the way digital technology works. These are the consequences of digital technology. Get used to it. You try to stand up to it. You know, you're labeled as anti-progress. They pull out the Luddite word, and so on and so forth. That is baloney. Forget about that. This has nothing to do with digital technology. Lots of examples in the book in that window before surveillance capitalism was invented and spread and institutionalized, people were doing smart homes and people were doing telemedicine and they were doing it with a simple closed loop. You got your devices, you got your data, you got your occupant of the home, you got your patient, that's all. And you figure out how to monetize it in those terms. That's empowering, that's democratizing, that's the digital, that's all the stuff we ever wanted. These guys found, as the crow flies to monetization when they figured out this, log this economic logic of surveillance capitalism. And once they figured it out, they upped the ante and everyone went there. Everyone went for that 3,590%. And so the whole thing got distorted. But this has nothing to do with the digital. This is a specific economic logic invented in a time and place by specific people that hijack the digital to an insanely lucrative economic project. Now, I consider this very good news. Why? Because it is really hard to get out in front of an entire technological structural transformation. But it is not insanely hard to get out of in front, to get out in front of a rogue 
raw, destructive capitalism that has been able to root and flourish for two decades wholly unimpeded or nearly unimpeded by law. We ended the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age and the Gilded Age, the great, we call them now robber barons in retrospect for good reason. But at the time, they were just like really rich, smart people, smarter than us, we thought. And at the time, they said, we don't need any law. We have enough law. We have the law of supply and demand, and we have the law of survival of the fittest. So screw law. We don't want your law. Law is an absence of freedom, they said. Our surveillance capitalists say the same thing. We don't want law. Law will, uh, law will mean an absence of freedom. Law will disturb and kill innovation. We don't want law. But we ended the Gilded Age because in those days, people discovered their shared economic interests. They, they formed into new kinds of institutions of collective action. They demanded the resources of their democratic institutions. And ultimately, it was years and decades. But ultimately, we had law. We had regulatory regimes. And the uh, Gilded Age did end. We use these same mechanisms in the Depression. We use these same mechanisms in the post-war era. We know how to tame, name and tame raw capitalism and tether it to the interests of democracy and people. We did it before. We can do it again. I had a revelation the other day at a book signing at a really cool event like this in London. And a book signing and a young woman, beautiful young woman like you, she comes up and she wants me to sign her book, but she's feeling really kind of like depressed. Like, I've depressed her. Like, how are we going to fight this and democracy? And is democracy lost? And, and she's talking to me about democracy. And all of a sudden, the light went off in my head. So I can't make this mistake twice. So I realized that she was thinking of democracy like, like a boulder, like a mountain. And it's there when you're born, and it's there when you die, and it is immutable and immovable as democracy. But I said to her, that's not what democracy is. Democracy is like, you know, in the 19th century when kids didn't have toys, they would get these, these big hoops, you know, and the idea was you roll the hoop, and then you got to run after it, and it begins to wobble at a certain point. And the whole game is that you catch up to it before it wobbles and falls over. And you got to keep it up, and you got to keep the momentum going. That's the game. You've always got to be there by its side to keep it rolling. That's what democracy is. Democracy is the hoop. And we send it out there with our momentum, but then we got to run after it. And it's going to wobble, and we got to get there before it falls over, and we got to make sure that it keeps going. That's what democracy is. So it's not like, well, one generation did it, and then we all sit back and take pictures. <laughs> We've all got to do it. That is our work now. That is our work now. So we've got collective action. We've got collective actions summoning the resources of our democratic institutions. We've got opportunities for new competitive solutions. Because you ask anybody, there's a reason why all of this stuff is designed to keep us ignorant. Because nobody wants anything to do with it. A huge opportunity for competitive solutions that actually reconnect us with the digital and put us on the track to a different trajectory to the future, the one we wanted in the first place. We've got opportunities for new kind of tech that actually help us do what we want to do. So there are all kinds of pieces in this solution space that are historic, our work now. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> I can't, I can't snap with my left hand. Um, so I, th um, speaking of rolling along, yes, no, we're, we're out of, we've run out of time. So maybe, maybe we could take a couple of questions uh, and then um, Shoshana, maybe you could respond to those which you feel inclined to respond to.
please keep your question to a question, not a statement. And we're just going to take them uh, one at a time, and then you can address them. So right up here in the front. I'm going to be very short. And uh, please just state your name. Uh, Doc Searles. Um, have any alpha surveillance capitalists come to you and said, oh my god, you got it right. We're going to revise all this thing. No. <laughs> Yeah, so the challenge is the dominant platforms are not easy, they're not inclined to change. We can do laws like data as labor laws, but it's not clear how to f implement them. One thing that seems to me an easy thing to do is just mandate, sort of like we do with auto fuel economy, that some percentage of the revenue of a dominant platform has to come from users, not advertisers, and gradually increase that percentage to just force the advertising down and force them to user revenue models. And even if they do advertising with a reverse meter and credit it to users, it puts a value on attention and data so that now there's a way to negotiate how much you're paying or getting paid for your attention and data. And it seems to me that's a powerful lever to drive things that's very simple and doesn't interfere with market forces so that they can figure out how to do it. And I'm curious whether you've heard that strategy and whether you think it makes sense. Um, since the conversation seems to be leaning this way, we're going to go a couple, a couple more minutes. Okay. And, I'll, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll come back and hit the highlights. Yeah. Okay. Shoshana, much of your argument rests on the idea that this was intentional and by design. And, you know, as an STS scholar who sort of resists the notion of technological determinism, I struggle with this because... I think it's reasonable to read it backwards and say it was all intentional, but I think experience, empirical evidence, and a lot of STS critique would say that most of these things occur through a set of other kinds of conditions. So if I'm thinking about Charles Perrault or Diane Vaughn, many of the most egregious kinds of accidents that emerge in our environment occur because of a lot of locally minimal rational decisions, right? So folks at the center making reasonable decisions, thoughtful decisions, often starting from a good place. And so I'm curious how you would reimagine your analysis if you didn't take for granted that this was an intentional bad actor group, but actually situated this as, as the product of a lot of people trying to do right. Well, actually, um I, I don't agree that I that my analysis is is one of an, an original bad actor group. Far from it. Um, when I talk about the uh, discovery, invention, and elaboration of surveillance capitalism at Google, I talk about it as um, people who had um, very clear principles around uh, many of these issues, uh, who were caught in a moment of financial emergency. And I describe it as um, you know the, the the state of exception that uh, under the the heat of financial emergency they declared a state of exception and consciously decided to suspend or bend or set aside uh, some of their publicly stated principles in order to find a way through the emergency because saving the company was paramount. So there's a there's a real uh, and I, you know and I'm very explicit about this. This is a uh, a men made it kind of thing, a trial and error, a tinkering, a figuring out you know how do we get through this, and a discovery that hit on a solution, that hit on a set of processes um, and a kind of solution that in retrospect embodies a new economic logic. And that is not unlike, uh, as I compare it to, the discovery of mass production. You know, nobody, nobody sat down at a big, big chart and outlined all the elements of mass production. It was trial and error. Elements were added. Elements were taken away. Things were changed. Things were tried. There was experimentation. 
but ultimately something cohered and came together, and that was institutionalized. And so it was when they discovered the huge increase in revenue that was possible using these new methods, then the wagons, uh, uh, they circled the wagons here. And then things got institutionalized. And then there was a much more explicit intention about, um, about keeping these, these insights proprietary and working them out and using them for competitive advantage and keeping them secret. And also the need to keep them secret from the persons whose data were being unilaterally captured uh, so that people who had data in online spaces that they didn't know about, that was being folded into these surplus caches, uh, that, that e even the scientists were talking about, we know how to do this so that even data that people say they don't want to share or even data that people do not share, we can either find it or we can deduce it. For a long time, scholars have talked about the privacy paradox and the idea that uh, we, when we're exposed to these practices, we say we don't want to do them, we don't want anything to do with them, we want to be protected from them, but we keep behaving, we keep behaving the same way, we keep participating in them. And, um, and this, I think, is not a privacy paradox, but rather uh, a kind of no exit situation, a kind of market failure that has been created by the fact that uh, we all want something different, but those alternatives have been slowly foreclosed as this has been institutionalized. So I don't see this as a conspiracy or a design, but ultimately the when they understood the financial stakes on the table, then yes, very specific and intentional design for user ignorance, right down to the write-ups in Nature and the scholarly write-ups about the, for example, the Facebook contagion experiments, where the researchers actually boasted, we now know we can cause behavioral change in the real world based on emotional contagion that we can perpetrate in the online world, and we can do it always evading users' awareness. Bypassing users' awareness is a critical success factor here. Ergo, the logic of surveillance, the social relations of the one-way mirror, which became the, the, essential. The version that you've just laid out, which is very compelling, is not historically accurate. I mean, I was at Google during this window. I know all the meetings that we had with EFF, with community stakeholders. I remember the details of why we had to stop sharing as the IPO was happening. Yes, I agree with you that, that many of these things have become deeply problematic, but even the story you've told of the emotional contagion story, that's not how that unfolded. And I think this is where I find it frustrating and I really want to follow you. And I really want to believe in what you're arguing because I believe in surveillance capitalism is an important thing. But I don't think you are depicting a lot of these moments in time with where they were at that time. Well, you know, <laughs> you're, what, what I have gone to pains to do in this book is to talk about an economic logic and I've said over and over again, this is not about bad people. This is not about evil people. This is not about evil managers of great corporations. This is something I repeat over and over. The idea here is that an economic logic has been created and institutionalized on which huge market capitalization now rests. This e economic logic has imperatives and you can predict the behavior that will occur in these companies by understanding the economic logic. That doesn't mean that every individual in the organization actually even understands these economic imperatives or, or what they're doing. But the economic imperatives, once you grasp them, predict the behavior. In the same way, I quote uh, Andy Bosworth's amazing internal memo 
uh, which is the perfect description of what I call radical indifference. Connectivity equals economic growth. We connect, we grow. We connect, someone uses our connection to pull off a terrorist plot, that's too bad, but we continue connecting because connection is growth. We connect, some people find each other and fall in love, marry, live happily ever after, that's great. We continue to connect no matter what we connect. This is the idea of radical indifference. These are economic imperatives. Normal people, these are not, it's not like every bad person went over there to work on surveillance capitalism. This is all people like us caught up in an economic logic that is unprecedented, that has not been named, that has barely been recognized even by the people who are practicing it. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing. This is institutional, this is a logic, this is pervasive now across our economy. It's not just Google, it's not just Facebook, which by the way is the second category error, that this is just related to a couple of big companies. This is now the, head, the CEO of Ford Motor, who says, we want PEs like Google and Facebook. We want market cap like Google and Facebook. Nobody wants to buy cars anymore on planet Earth. What are we gonna do? Oh, I know, let's sell data. We have 100 million people driving around in four cars. Let's get all the data from that. Let's put it together with the data from Ford Credit where he says, we already know everything about you. Then we're running with the big boys. We're up there, who wouldn't want to source predictive data from Ford Motor. This is an economic logic, and it's transforming industry after industry. We see it in insurance, we see it in finance, we see it in health, we see it in education. This is not about a planet suddenly gone evil. This is about an economic logic that has no law to stop it, and that is what our work is.